Hi, everyone. My name is Andrew. I'm the founder and owner of Ibis Prep. And today we are doing our last multiple choice workshop for the February 2024 administration. We just spent time off camera doing questions for corporations and partnerships. And I've given the students access to a lot of questions that I think my class, this administration, is going to outperform everyone in the state on the Florida multiple choice questions based on the amount of preparation we've done so far. But there's still some work to do. Today, we're going to do some business endies, commercial paper, secure transactions questions. Um, and I'm reporting live from Virginia. And Virginia is for lovers. Okay. So let's start with this first question. Which of the following is not a requirement for a valid partnership under Florida law? At least two persons, a written partnership agreement, an intention to carry on a business for profit, or joint control and management of the business? Yeah, I agree with Keisha. We're going to say B because it doesn't have to be in writing, although it should. It doesn't have to be. If it was a corporation, we must file the Articles of Incorporation. Under Florida law, what is the default rule for partnership profits and losses sharing in the absence of a partnership agreement? Sharing of profits and losses equally, sharing of profits and losses in proportion to capital contributions, sharing of profits and losses based on the time devoted to the partnership, or sharing of profits and losses by lot? Yes, A, sharing of profits and losses equally. By lot, that word comes up in Prim law, where you cannot have a jury verdict that was determined by lot. By lot means arbitrarily. Sharing of profits and losses equally under Florida law in the absence of a partnership agreement. The default rule for sharing partnership profits and losses is that they are shared equally among the partners. This is based on the Uniform Partnership Act and Florida has adopted with some modifications, uh, the RUPA, Revised Uniform Partnership Act. In Florida, which of the following statements regarding an LLP is false? An LLP must file a statement of qualification with the Florida Department of State. An LLP must obtain an EIN, Employment Identification Number. All partners in LLP have limited liability for partnership obligations. An LLP partner is not personally liable for their own malpractice. Which one is false? Three of them are true. Exactly, D. And in an LLP, you are still liable for your own malpractice. You're just not liable for the malpractice of others. So if we have an LLP, me, Tommy, and Johnny, and I am a dentist, and I stab someone in the cheek, you know, I will be liable for my own malpractice, but they will not be liable. An LLP partner is not personally liable for their own malpractice in LLP. That is a false statement. While the liability of the partners for the obligation of the partnership is limited, each partner is still personally liable for their own malpractice or wrongful acts. Therefore, the statement LLP partner is not personally liable for all malpractice is false. Because I was limited to 50 questions, and I'm hoping to have our next Q Bank up and, and, and running sooner than later before the exam. Um, the business and these questions, I wrote a lot like this. Which one is false? Why? So you could learn three true statements. I think that's an effective way to teach when you write questions is if you can just learn the three true statements, you can actually learn three things from every question. So we must learn from this one. An LLP must file a statement of qualification with the Florida Department of State. An LLP must obtain an employment identification number. And all partners in LLP have limited liability for partnership obligations, but they are still personally liable for their own malpractice. There's another one. Which of the following statements about business entities in Florida is false? In a general partnership, all partners have equal rights to the management and conduct of the partnership business. Sorry. B, in a limited liability company, members are generally not personally liable for the company's debts and obligations. In a limited partnership, both general partners and limited partners have equal rights to participate in the management of the business. In a corporation, shareholders have limited liability for the corporation's debts and obligations. Which one of these is false? Exactly. Only the general partner is going to have the right to manage the business. The limited partner is just a contributor, an investor. It's the general partner who's going to be the manager of the business. 
C, in a limited partnership, both general partners and limited partners have equal rights to participate in the management of the business. The statement is false. In a limited partnership in Florida, general partners have the right to participate in the management and control of the business, while limited partners generally do not have management rights. Limited partners mainly provide capital contributions and receive a share of profits, but their liability is limited to the extent of their investment in the partnership. Under Florida law, which of the following statements about a partner's fiduciary duties in general in a general partnership is false. So three of these are true. Which one is false? The duty of loyalty includes the obligation to account for profits derived from the use of partnership property. The duty of care requires partnerships to act with care an ordinarily prudent person would exercise under similar circumstances. The duty of loyalty includes the obligation to not compete with the partnership in the conduct of partnership businesses, a partnership business. And the duty of care requires partners to indemnify the partnership for any losses caused by their intentional misconduct. Which one is false? Yeah, I think D is false. Duty of care, you don't have to identify the partners for any losses caused by their intentional misconduct. And just in general, in, in business, we don't like to shield people from intentional misconduct. So we're not going to uh, agree that that's a true statement. The duty of care requires partners to identify the partnership for any losses caused by their intentional misconduct is a false statement. The duty of care requires partners to act with care ordinarily prudent person when exercising under similar circumstances. The duty of loyalty includes the obligations to account for profits derived from the use of partnership property and to not compete with the partnership in the conduct of the partnership business. Now, sometimes you can compete with the partnership or corporation, but of course you need to have consent of, in the corporation, the majority of disinterested um, uh, board of directors and in a partnership, you know, the con written consent of everyone else. But sometimes, you know, maybe you know, it would be fruitful for IBIS prep to uh, purchase some other tutoring company services that would seem to compete with us, but we could get the consent and there would be reason to do it. So you got to kind of put yourself in the shoes of a business person. Another big thing they love to test in Florida is the business judgment rule, which means that business people have more information on the inside than you do on the outside. So we are going to assume in the absence of clear conduct, clear misconduct, in the absence of clear misconduct, we're going to assume that they acted in the best interest of the business, even if they lost money, even if, you know, things went awry. Sometimes things went awry, but they didn't go as awry as they could have. You know, um, here's a business judgment rule. I saw Budweiser, they got a spokesperson and, and they were um, gender fluid. And then they lost a lot of customers from it. And then somehow the gender fluid spokesperson was mad at Budweiser too. And I'm like, this is a general catastrophe, right? Like the spokesperson doesn't like them. And the people who don't like the spokesperson don't like them. They lost sales and Modelo was doing more sales in America than Budweiser, ironically enough, right? They're not an American-based company. But again, whoever made all those decisions, we're gonna assume that they were protecting them from even worse decisions and in the absence of clear misconduct, they will be protected by the business judgment rule. All right. Which of the following business entities in Florida requires a registered agent to be identified in its formation documents? General partnership, limited partnership, limited liability partnership, or corporation? Yeah, this is a corporation. This is articles of incorporation. We want to identify the registered agent. In general, corporations require much more formality than partnerships. A registered agent is required for a corporation in Florida. A registered agent is an individual or business entity designated by the corporation to receive legal and other official documents on behalf of the corporation. Under Florida law, what is the minimum number of directors in the corporation? One, two, three, or it depends on the number of shareholders. I agree. We just need one. Look at me. I'm the director. <laughs> Under Florida law, a corporation can have one or more directors. However, the number of directors must be specified in the Articles of Incorporation or bylaws. Articles of Incorporation are filed with the Secretary of State. They're like very formal. Bylaws are more just the rules and regulations that we come up with as a company. Which of the following is not a requirement for the issuance of shares in a Florida corporation? Authorization of the AOI, consideration received by the corporation, compliance with securities laws and regulations, a resolution by the board of directors.
tough question. I like D too. You definitely need A, B, and C, which leads me to believe you don't need D. So while a board resolution is often used to authorize issuing shares, it's not a requirement or Florida law. The other requirements are required. Authorization in the articles of corporation, consideration received by the corporation, and compliance with the securities laws and regulations. In a Florida corporation, which of the following statements about cumulative voting rights is false? Cumulative voting rights, for whatever reason, they love to test. So let's see what's true. Three things are true about cumulative voting. One of them is false. Cumulative voting rights are provided in the articles of incorporation. They must be provided in the articles of incorporation. Cumulative voting rights allow shareholders to cast multiple votes for a single director nominee. Cumulative voting rights enhance minority shareholder representation on the board of directors. Cumulative voting rights are mandatory for all corporations in Florida. Right. The complaint y'all may want to make against me is my questions are too easy but I prefer to teach the fundamentals because that's what's gonna help people. I don't wanna confuse people. I want to teach fundamentals. These three pieces are fundamental. Cumulative voting rights are, must be provided in the articles of incorporation. Cumulative voting allows investors to stack their votes for a single nominee. And cumulative voting rights are said to benefit the small investor, the minority shareholder but they're not mandatory. They have to either be uh, stated or not stated. If it's silent, we will assume that they are not um, cumulative voting. Cumulative voting rights are mandatory for all for corporations in Florida. This statement is false. While cumulative voting rights can be provided in the articles of incorporation, they are not mandatory under Florida law. Under Florida law, which of the following actions requires approval by majority of the corporation's disinterested directors? Issuance of shares, distribution of dividends, approval of a merger, Approval of a conflict of interest transaction. Yeah, it's going to be D. This is a great question. <laughs> Sorry. This is a good question, though, because we want to know what a disinterested director is. A disinterested director, also known as a qualified director, is someone on the board of directors who's not interested in the conflict of interest transaction, right? You know, I just prep, we're trying to uh, hire consulting work from uh, Chuck Cohn, the owner of Varsity Tutors, right? Dude went public for $2 billion or $3 billion or seven, I don't know, too many billions of dollars, actually maybe $1.8 billion, but enough billion dollars that I would like to do some, I would like to hire him for some consulting work, right? Oh, that's a conflict of interest. You know, Varsity Tutors and I was prep competing against each other. Well, Andrew, I'm not going to be allowed to vote on it. But if Alexis, Jesse, James, Sam, they all get together and they vote, they're disinterested, they're qualified, and they vote by majority to approve it, we can do it. These three items, issuance of shares, distribution of dividends, approval of merger, um, they may require shareholder approval, but not disinterested director approval. So D, approval of a conflict of interest transaction under Florida law. A conflict of interest transaction requires approval by the disinterested directors, or if there are none, approval by the shareholders. The other actions listed may also require approval by the board of directors, but do not necessarily require approval by majority of disinterested directors. In Florida, which of the following does not fall under the business judgment rule? Decisions made on reasonable reliance on experts' advice, decisions made in the best interest of the corporation, decisions made in good faith, or decisions based on intentional misconduct. Exactly. It's got to be D as in the decisions based on intentional misconduct. Decisions based on intentional misconduct do not fall under the business judgment rule. The business judgment rule provides that directors and officers of a corporation are generally protected from liability for their decisions as long as the decisions are made in good faith and the best interest of the corporation and based on reasonable reliance on experts' advice. That's what I was talking about with the Budweiser guys. Like, we're going to say it was a good decision to hire the gender fluid person to you know, promote to a bunch of NASCAR drivers. And then we're going to decide it was a good decision to fire her, fire the gender fluid person and say that we don't align with them. Like those were all decisions that we're going to assume were in the best interest of Budweiser, even though to the outside, they both seem questionable to someone. I don't, I'm not a huge beer drinker. I, I can care less. I, I grew up in Pennsylvania. They like yingling up there. All right. Which of the following statements? And in, in Miami, we like a, Land shark. Which of the following statements regarding the identification of directors and officers in a Florida corporation is false? 
Okay, indemnification of directors and officers. Mandatory indemnification is provided when director or officer is successful in defending a claim against them. Permissive indemnification may be provided if a director or officer acted in good faith in the best interest of the corporation. Indemnification is limited to the amount of actual expenses incurred by the director or officer. A corporation must always indemnify a director or officer regardless of their conduct or the outcome of the legal proceeding. Common sense will tell us D is the correct answer, but we learn three important things about mandatory indemnification if they win the claim, permissive indemnification if it's in the best interest of the corporation, and you're only going to be indemnified by the amount of actual expenses incurred, but they don't always have to indemnify you. There are specific criteria that must be met for mandatory and permissive indemnification. Mandatory indemnification is provided when director or officer is successful in defending a claim against them. Permissive indemnification may be provided if a director or officer acted in good faith in the best interest of the corporation. A corporation is not required to identify director or officer in all circumstances, especially if they fail to meet these standards of conduct or are found liable for willful misconduct or other prohibited acts. It's weather here in Virginia. It's not good. I hope it's good in Miami. I should be home by like four in the morning. Under Florida law, which of the following statements about a corporation's right to inspect its shareholders list is false? A shareholders have the right to inspect the corporation's shareholder list. The shareholders list must be made available at the corporation's principal office. The shareholders must have a proper purpose to inspect the shareholder list or the obviously false one. The right to inspect the shareholders list is not subject to any restrictions. It is certainly subject to restrictions. It has to be for the purpose of um, what they are stating. So while shareholders have the right to inspect the corporation shareholder list, it's subject to certain restrictions, such as the requirement shareholders have a proper purpose for inspection. Which of the following statements about shareholder voting in a Florida corporation is false? A simple majority vote of shareholders is typically required to amend the articles of incorporation. A simple majority vote of shareholders is typically required for the approval of a merger or consolidation. A simple majority of shareholders is typically required for the dissolution of the corporation. A supermajority of shareholders is always required for amending the AOI, approval of merger, consolidation, and dissolving the corporation. We're not going to need the supermajority. There's certain things that you might need a supermajority for. Um, it's statutory. I don't even want to say the wrong information. I'll circle back on that. But these three things, you only need a simple majority. If anyone in the chat wants to clarify anything that they remember that they're clear upon, that in business entities requires a super majority, um, please let us know. I could think of Florida law, you know, maybe uh, for um, speaking about something other than the purpose of a special legislative session requires a two thirds vote. Or I could think of actually removing a president after impeachment and federal law requires a two thirds vote. There are some instances in business entities that do require a super majority. I just don't want to say anything incorrect on camera. Okay. Andrew and Brian, best friends and from, from the day I was born, are shareholders in a Florida corporation. Andrew owns 45% of shares and Brian owns 55%, 55%. Andrew believes that Brian's engaging in fraudulent behavior that is harming the corporation. Which of the following is not a step Andrew should typically take to initiate a derivative lawsuit in Florida? Derivative lawsuit is... Um, suing on behalf of the company. A direct lawsuit is pretty much suing the company. So if you want to make a derivative suit, what should you do? File a demand on the board of directors to the, address the issue? Absolutely. File a complaint in the court and name the corporation? Sure. Shell his shares to Brian before filing the lawsuit? Absolutely not. That sounds ridiculous. Andrew should be a shareholder of the corporation at the time of the alleged wrongdoing. They like to test that. That's indeed true. You do have to own shares at the alleged of the at the time of the alleged breach, or you don't have any rights to bring a derivative suit. You need to provide notice as well. And then the um, disinterested shareholders, and here in this case, there aren't really, aren't really any, but usually disinterested shareholders do need to determine that you do have a viable claim. And then it would be, they're not gonna bring it and you should bring it type of situation. Okay, selling a shares to Brian for the lawsuit would not be a step in initiating a derivative lawsuit. Before filing a lawsuit, the plaintiff shareholder um, would maintain it and need status to bring the suit. All right, we'll do a few more of these and then we'll switch to commercial paper and secure transactions and call it afternoon. I have a student at two o'clock, so I'll be posted up at this Publix. 
Um, in a Florida limited liability corporation, which of the following statements about the rights of members is false? Members have the right to vote on certain major decisions. Members have a right to share the LLC's profits and losses. Members have a right to manage the LLC directly. Members have the right to freely transfer their membership interest without the consent of the members, which is false. D. Yeah, I almost tripped my own self up on this because I'm thinking, wait, aren't managers the one who manage the LLC? But that's only if it's manager, if it's a member, manage, if it's a manager, member manage LLC. But this doesn't imply that from the fact pattern. Do they not have the right to transfer without the consent of the other members? I don't think so. It's not like a partnership. I do think they need the consent. I'll I'll go with the class on this one. I think we are correct. Nice. Members have the right to freely transfer their membership interest without the consent of other members. That's false. Unless the operating agreement provides otherwise, members of Florida LLC generally cannot freely transfer their membership interest without the consent of the other members. I got a little bit tripped up on C because of manager mem manager managed versus member managed, but like there wasn't enough information from the question to be able to pick C. All right. Brian and Andrew formed a general partnership in Florida after they drafted a partnership agreement. After a year, Brian decides to leave the partnership. Which of the following is true about Brian's ability to dissociate from the partnership under Florida law? Brian cannot dissociate from the partnership because there's no written partnership agreement. Brian can dissociate from the partnership at any time, but he may be liable for damages if the dissociation has breached the partnership agreement. Brian can dissociate from the partnership at any time, and he will not be liable for any damages because there is no partnership agreement. He literally says they drafted a partnership agreement. And then Brian cannot dissociate from the partnership unless Andrew also agrees to dissolve the partnership. Yeah, I think B. Yeah, I like that B. I almost bought a B necklace. It was like a B that was engraved in like some bone. It was like a bone and a B inside. But then I ended up going with um this. It's uh, a pine tree or something. I forget. Oh, it's a fern. That's right. It's a fern. It's a fern. And ferns hold water. And I like water. So leave me alone. All right. 18. Which of the following businesses entities in Florida does not require the filing of an annual report with the Florida Department of State? A corporation, LLC, and LP or general partnership. What's the most informal one here? Yeah, general partnership is going to be the most informal. General partnership, um, you don't have to file an annual report with the Department of State. I actually just got a notice, an email. I have to file my annual report for Abbas Prep. It's not that fun running a business for y'all out there with business um, aspirations. Ibis Inc. is a California corporation transacting business in Florida. Until it attains a certificate of authority to transact business in Florida, so until we have that certificate, which of the following activities is Ibis prohibited from doing in Florida? Maintaining a proceeding in any court in Florida, defending a proceeding in any court in Florida, obtaining orders by mail from Florida residents which require acceptance in California, or selling its products to independent contractors in Florida. Yeah, we're not going to be able to maintain this proceeding. Um, maintaining a proceeding in Florida, according to Florida law, a corporation incorporated in one state but doing business in another is usually not permitted to initiate or maintain a legal proceeding in the court of the state where it's doing business until it obtains a certificate of authority to do business in that state. However, they can defend itself, accept mail, and sell products. Selling products. That's James and I's favorite uh, were favorite slogan is selling products because when we worked together in financial planning, this kid was training and he, we had to like interview him for his training meeting. It was like a practice. And his session went like this. He's like, hi, my name is Jack. And obviously I'm here to sell you some products. And we're like, no, you're here to do holistic financial planning. Like he was just like, I am here to sell you some products. So me and James always joke. That's what we're here to do. Get straight to it. We're here to sell products. All right. Last but not least for business entities under Florida law, which of the following statements about a general partner's liability and a limited partnership is false? A general partner is personally liable for partnership obligations. A general partner's liability is limited to our capital contribution to the partnership. A general partner is personally liable for partnership torts. And a general partner's liability for partnership contracts is joint and several with other general partners. Which one is false? Hey, thank you. I think it's got to be B, right? General partners are personally liable. They're going down. It's limited partners who are limited to capital contribution. I think B is the correct answer here. 
A general partner's liabilities limit their capital contribution to the partnership. This statement is false. A general partner in Florida and a Florida limited partnership is personally liable for partnership obligations and torts, and the liability for partnership contracts is joint in several other general partners. It got significantly colder out here. I will say that. Okay, that's amazing. We did an amazing job, and let's just keep it up. And this is just uh, another demonstration of being resilient because it dropped like 20 degrees all of a sudden in Virginia. All right, let's do some commercial paper. What is the primary purpose of a negotiable instrument? To serve as a form of identification, to facilitate the transfer of money or payment, to provide proof of ownership in a business, or to authorize legal actions in a financial transaction. Now the wind's at my face at least. All right, yeah, B. Uh, negotiable instrument is going to be to serve as a medium of exchange for money. It's to facilitate the transfer of money or payment between parties. Negotiable instruments are commonly found in financial transactions as a convenient and widely accepted method for transferring funds, making payment, or establishing financial obligations. They provide a means of payment that can be transferred from one party to another, providing assurance and efficiency in commercial transactions. Under the UCC, which of the following could potentially be recognized as a valid signature on a negotiable instrument? Oh, sorry. The maker's printed name, the maker's initials, the maker's thumbprint, or all of the above. Yeah, drop of blood, anything is going to be fine for a signature. According to the Uniform Commercial Code, the UCC, which of the following warranties does a transfer make to a transferee when transferring a negotiable instrument? The transfer guarantees they are representative of a prominent bank. The transfer assures that the instrument has not been materially altered. The transfer promises the instrument will be paid in full by the drawee. Um, the transferee, transfer promises to compensate the transferee if the instrument value decreases. Yeah, it hasn't been materially altered. That's going to be a um, one of the transfer warranties. The transfer assures that the instrument has not been materially altered. Under the UCC, a person transferring a negotiable instrument provides certain warranties to the recipient of the instrument. One of these warranties is that the instrument has not been materially altered. The transfer ensures the instrument is as it was when originally issued, which provides the recipient with some level of security. Michael receives a promissory note payable to the order of Andrew. Michael transfers the note to Brian by signing the back of the note and writing, pay to the order of Brian. What type of endorsement is this? A blank endorsement, a special endorsement, a qualified endorsement, or restrictive endorsement? Yeah, I think this is a special endorsement because it says who it's going to. This is a special endorsement. A special endorsement specifies the person to whom the instrument is to be paid. Special endorsement specifies. A blank endorsement would simply be the signature of the endorser, right? If any of y'all want to write Ibis Prep, a little blank endorsement, we'll be happy to take it. Well, a qualified endorsement and restrictive endorsement have specific legal requirements. Okay, let's do a few more and then we'll do some secure transactions. Which of the following is not a requirement for Instrument to be considered a negotiable instrument under Article 3 of the UCC. You remember this one. Does anyone feel confident that they could tell the class the elements of negotiability for a commercial paper instrument? I'll try it out. Let's do it. Um, it must be a signed writing, unconditional, uh, with a fixed amount, definite time to order or bearer, and uh, no additional undertakings. Wonderful. A signed, written, unconditional, promise to pay a fixed sum of money with or without interest on demand or definitive time to order or bear with no additional undertakings. So which one is not a requirement? It must be signed by the maker or drawer. It must contain unconditional promise or order to pay. It must be payable a fixed or terminal date or must be payable to the order of a specific person or to the bearer. So this is a tough one, but do you see how C is actually the correct answer? It must be payable on a fixed or terminal date um, or on demand, right? It could also be payable on demand, which makes C the answer. I had to think that one all the way through, but I believe signed, unconditional, order or bearer, but C to me 
if I know my own question, I think is the answer, right? Because it could be payable on demand. One of the requirements for an instrument to be considered negotiable is that it must be payable on demand or at a fixed or terminal future time. Therefore, it's not necessary that instrument be paid at a definitive date as it can also be paid on demand. See, I do have some hard questions in here. They're not all easy. That one took a little bit of mental muscle. All right. Andrew is the holder of a negotiable instrument. Believe for me. In order to negotiate the instrument, oh man, what must he do? Transfer possession of the instrument, endorse the instrument, transfer possession and endorse the instrument, or notify the prior holder of the transfer. Yeah, I'm going to go with C. Honestly, I think this question could be tough because we're not sure if it's order paper or bearer paper, but I'm just going to assume that um, it's order paper. Yeah. To ne transfer a negotiable instrument, the holder must transfer possession and endorsement. Um, it cannot be negotiated. You could potentially if it's bearer paper. So I'll caveat that question. All right. 13, in honor of our favorite quarterback, Dan Marino, which of the following defenses is available to a maker of a negotiable instrument against a holder in due course? So which of the following is available? For on the factum, unauthorized completion, breach of contract, or lack of consideration? Yeah, we're going to go fraud in the factum here, right? Fraud in the factum is one of the real defenses. Fades, fraud in the factum, alteration, illegality, in um, infancy, duress, discharge in court, statute of limitations, surgeryship. Those are some of the real defenses. Where These are some good examples of contract defenses, personal defenses. Fraud in the factum. Fraud in the factum is a defense that's available to the maker of a negotiable instrument against a holder in due course. Fraud in the factum occurs when the maker is deceived as to the nature of the instrument he is signing. All right, last but not least, let's secure the proverbial bag with some secured transactions. And I'm going to get a coat after that. Which of the following is true regarding the priority of security interest and collateral under Article 9 of the UCC in Florida? I feel like, Gabby, this is the question we prepared for. A perfected security interest has always has priority over an unperfected security interest in the same collateral. An unperfected security interest always has priority over perfected security interest in the same collateral. The first party to attach a security interest in the collateral has priority over later parties to attach security interest in the same collateral. All security interests in the same collateral have equal priority. It's got to be A, right? Remember the hierarchy. PMSI at the top then first in time perfected, then second in time perfected, third in time perfected, whatever it may be, then first in time unperfected, then second in time unperfected. And um, if we're stuck, it's they have nothing, it's just first to attach. But perfected will always be unperfected. It's like Pokemon. A perfected security interest always has priority over an unperfected security interest in the same collateral. The general rule of priority is subject to certain exceptions, but in most cases, perfection gives a security party Priority over later creditors. Which of the following is true regarding the debtor's rights in after acquired property under Article 9 of the UCC in Florida, assuming the security agreement includes an after acquired property clause? So, after acquired property means like I am securing an interest in your tractor and any other tractors you get or any other farm equipment you get afterwards, right? I was about to tell you what the answer probably is to this question. The debtor has the right to acquire property free of any security interest. The debtor's rights in after acquired property are automatically subject to any security interest in the same type of property. I'm not smiling. I was just reading that regular. The debtor's rights in after acquired property are subject to a security interest in the same type of property only if the security interest is perfected. The debtor's rights in after acquired property are subject to a security interest in the same type of property only if the security interest is unperfected. Yeah. I was smiling. Well, I say the debtor's rights in after acquired property are automatically subject to any security interest in the same type of property, right? If I have the tractor and then I, it automatically attach the additional tractors if there is an after acquired property clause. Um, this is assuming the security interest includes an after acquired property clause, which is common. It's important to note that not all security interests extend to after acquired property. Only if the circuit party the debtor have agreed to this will it apply. Under Florida law, which of the following types of collateral is considered to be an investment property? Shares of a stock in a corporation, a debtor's interest in an LLC, an account maintained with a broker dealer, or all of the above? Yeah, I like all of the above here, right? All of the above could be collateral. 
stocks, debtors interest in LLC, and account maintained with the broker dealer. All right, Harrison approached Finance Co. for a loan of $60,000. Finance Co. was open to lending the requested amount with the condition that um, Harrison's grandfather's vintage art collection is used as collateral. Finance Co. seeks your legal counsel in relation to this plan, transac plan transaction. What step is mandatory in, for Finance Co. to establish an enforceable security interest in the collateral? Um, Harrison must authenticate a security agreement providing a clear description of the collateral. Harrison must file a finance statement that offers a clear description of the collateral. Finance Co. must take possession of the collateral. Finance Co. must send Harrison written confirmation saying that the art collection will serve as collateral for the loan. So how do you create a security interest? Any other thoughts? Yeah, I kind of think it's actually A, right? Let's let's look at the facts. Yeah, attachment via security agreement. Perfection via financing statement. Attachment or perfection via possession if it's like uh, an account or a, a promissory note maybe. But I don't see you taking possession of the entire art collection, right? I think A is the best answer here. A security agreement describing the collateral. Good job. Harrison must authenticate a security agreement providing a clear description of the collateral. Under Article 9 of the UCC, for security interest to be to attach and thus become enforceable, three conditions must be met. Value must be given. The debtor must have rights in the collateral. And the debtor must authenticate a security agreement that provides an adequate description of the collateral. Um, all right. Under Florida law, which of the following methods can be used to perfect a security interest and in deposit account? Authenticating a security agreement and filing with the state, taking possession of a deposit account, obtaining control of the deposit account, recording a mortgage on the deposit account. I'm going to say C, control. Yeah, you're going to take possession of the instrument, control of the account, file the financing statement for, because uh, it, it's not going to be A, because it's not about security agreement. It would be a financing statement. So A, if it said financing statement, could have been true. Possession, again, I don't see us taking possession of a deposit account. It's more of a control, username, password type of situation. I would guess C. C, obtaining control of the deposit account. The deposit account can be perfected by control. A security agreement gives a credit rights in the collateral, but it's not yet perfected. Further, the deposit account is not real property, so reporting a mortgage on it will not be applicable. Which of the following is an example of a PMSI under Article 9 of the UCC? Big topic, right? If they test secure transactions, they will test PMSIs. PMSIs are the same concept as PMMs in property. It's when you use the money that you borrow to buy the collateral itself, and that will um give the uh lender super priority priority above even a first in time perfected right a security interest in inventory that's granted to a bank that has lent money to the debtor to purchase the inventory we like that a security interest in a motor vehicle that's granted to a car dealership that has sold the vehicle to the debtor and financed the purchase a security interest in equipment that's granted to a manufacturer that has sold the equipment to the debtor and financed the purchase or all of the above I think these all seem to be examples of PMSI because they're financing the purchase, right? They're purchasing the inventory. Each of these scenarios involves a creditor providing the debtor with funds or credit to acquire specific goods with a creditor taking security interest in those goods. This is the definition of a PMSI. Now, if you were like, oh, it has to be consumer goods, you were thinking a little bit too far ahead. It has to be consumer goods for automatic perfection in a PMSI. Non-consumer goods will have a 20-day grace period, but you could have a PMSI in anything that will um, still be called a PMSI. Okay. Uh, I think we should end on number 13 in honor of our favorite quarterback, Dan Marino. Under Florida law, which of the following methods can be used to perfect a security interest in a motor vehicle? This is a Florida-specific law. Noting the lien on the certificate of title and or filing a financing statement, 
taking possession of the motor vehicle, obtaining control of the motor vehicle, or recording a mortgage on the motor vehicle. You got to take the car, right? <laughs> no, you have to note the lien on the certificate of title. That's very important when it comes to um, security agreements when it involves a motor vehicle. Any um, security interest needs to be noted on the um, title itself. Generally, the method of perfecting security interest in motor vehicles is by noting the lien on the vehicle's title. In some commercial transactions, filing a financing statement could be used, but it's more typical to note the lien on the title. Under Florida Statute 3.1927, each lien, mortgage, or encumbrance on a motor vehicle or mobile home titled in the state shall be noted upon the face of the Florida Certificate of Title or in a duplicate or corrected copy thereof, as provided by law. So today was a really good day. I, I had the class start off by doing some really hard business and these questions. And then we on this recording, we went over some fundamental questions for business endies and some good questions for secure transactions and commercial paper. First and foremost, I want everyone to finish the IBIS questions on Thinkific for business endies, commercial paper, and secure transactions, and then get after the additional questions that we've assigned. Um, for those of you who are going to be in my MBE class, I'll see you tomorrow at 11. And for those of you who are just here in Florida, class will resume on Monday and we'll be tackling next week uh, family law and ethics. And I know there's a lot of lovebirds in the room, but I think there will be class on Valentine's Day because time is of the essence. So, you know, bring some chocolate and maybe a glass of red wine to class and uh, we'll go from there. Thank you everyone for joining me. I'm going to go ahead and stop this recording.